Today we are going to talk about Ravel, uh, specifically about his piano concerto, 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 I don't know if you're American you say concerto, in G major for piano and orchestra. So there is a lot to unpack from this concerto. It's my favorite concerto. I know this doesn't sound very professional, like favorite composer, favorite piece, like what's your favorite composer? Typical question I get asked in interviews, which is quite silly. But to be honest, I think it's also an honest exercise to just admit what resonates the most with you, with your soul, as a musician and as a person. And I certainly resonate with Ravel quite a lot, especially with this piece and the D major piano concerto, which is the concerto for the left hand. Actually, I couldn't choose between both. And if I had to choose, I would choose the other one, the left hand piano concerto. So I promise I will do a video about that as well. Both concertos were composed uh, at the same time, actually. They are his late period concertos, um, pieces. Actually, I think he died not long after composing and finishing both pieces, and they couldn't be more different. Ravel was born in the south of France. He was born in Saint-Jean-de-Luz, San Juan de Luz, which is considered part of the French Basque country. And he was aware of these roots and this tradition, and he was quite proud of this heritage, cultural heritage. So the beginning of 20th century, so he finished this piece, I think, in 1930, around that year. But as soon as 1905, 1906, he was thinking about doing a piece for piano and orchestra with Basque influences. And there in those sketches, 20 years prior to the composition of this piece, you can already find melodies that he would use here, and he would call this concerto my Basque concerto. The very beginning is like that. This like whip crack, like the uh, cha, this uh, percussion instrument at the very beginning, followed by this pianissimo rumble of the drums. This uh, like, I don't know, resonance that is kept in the piano, this polytonality. You have at the same time this white keys in G major, tonica, tonica dominante tonica, but then you have these uh, black keys. This pentatonic thing. It reminds a little bit of Milio, for example, another composer who used a lot polytonality, or even Ginastera, Ginastera. In his first Argentinian dance, he does this. So right hand playing only white keys, left hand playing only black keys. This is a, a very typical polymodality, polytonality of this era. And then you have, of course, the piccolo melody, which, again, if you think it has some Spanish influence, let me tell you, it's from the north. It's from Basque country, maybe Navarra, uh, but for sure not from the south. It's not from Andalusia, from Sevilla. I come from Sevilla. That will come later. I will let you know. But this... That's a very kind of like proud, light, brilliant, full of light melody, which if you have been to the Basque country, especially the French Basque country and Saint-Jean-de-Luz, you will see where this theme comes from. So what do we do with this beginning? Because here Ravel, starting the piece, the second bit, okay? So should we make it apparent that it's not the down beat, but it's like going against the beat? Trying that would be, I think, useless, okay? Because you cannot do that. You cannot do like, I don't know, like one. Also, we have to bear in mind how the audience receives what we do. So the audience, when they listen to this and it begins like, pa ba ba pa ba 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 they hear a downbeat. That's like the, the, the sound phenomenon is they hear a beginning, a downbeat. So I think, the interesting thing is not that it's not beginning in the downbeat. The interesting thing of this beginning happens later, like one bar after that, because we are do we think like this, um, ba 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 pi ba 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 pi, and now we realize we are off beat, but we realize that later. We don't realize it on the spot. 
So it's kind of like a joke. It's a way of beginning in a quite, in a very light mood, right? Yeah. We sometimes think, we many times think of composers like this person who is going to do a very deep piece full of deep emotions and meaning. Ravel himself in interviews and letters said that his intention when composing this was doing something not profound, light, playful, a piece where the pianist could show his skills, his pianistic skills, much in the tradition of Mozart and Saint-Saëns. And that's actually something that can be striking, but if you are a, a, a soloist, you know that the piano concerto genre is full of music, but it's also full of showy techniques. Like many of the things Beethoven, Mozart, Liszt, Brahms, many of the things they write in the piano concertos in opposition to the sonatas are just for showing off. But since they are genius composers, those showing off things are also beautiful. Okay, that's the sweet spot. But we shouldn't be ashamed of thinking of these composers also as people who wanted to show off their technique, especially if they played themselves their concertos like Mozart and Beethoven. And Ravel himself is saying that the left hand piano concerto is completely different. There you have a lot of deep emotions, very tragical concerto, which ends actually in a catharsis, it's like a Greek tragedy, not here. So at the very beginning, we already have a very common problem in all piano concertos by every composer. How do we play together? So let me talk about vowels and consonants. When you are in the middle of this sound mass that is the orchestra, many of the sounds get lost. But the sounds that usually come through to your ears are the consonants, the articulation. So if you want to be together with the piccolo, for example, if you are unlucky and the acoustic is not very good, you won't hear the melody. You will hear just the consonants, like... So you won't hear so much the vowels, the sound itself, but the consonants. We don't hear the melody, but we hear the noise of the consonant. It's like when we speak. If you are in a disco with loud music and somebody's trying to talk to you, usually what you hear are the consonants, the T, uh, the k, the p, those get through the, the sound. The vowels kind of get lost. And I think it's not coincidence that in, in spoken language, vowels convey emotion and consonants edit that emotion. Consonants give structure to language. It's like a, a, a river. Vowels is the water flowing freely and consonants is where that water goes and directs the water to this place, to that place. There are rocks here, there's an island there. So I think in music, it's kind of the same. I would also say that's why instruments like percussion instruments, piano as well, tend to be more structural, tend to be, but they are not only that. And instruments like woodwinds and, uh, and strings, which are full of vowels and have a harder time making consonants, they tend to be less structural. Like they don't organize the discourse so much. This is a generalization, but I think it's very interesting when dealing with chamber music, because this piece is a chamber music concerto. Again, Ravel didn't want like this massive, uh, I don't know, massive overground neo-romantic piece full of passions and emotions. He wanted clarity. And that's why the orchestra in this concerto is very small, actually especially if you compare it to the left-hand piano concerto, which is paradoxical because the left-hand piano concerto, the pianist can only play with one hand. And you have to fight against a full orchestra, which is very big and very loud. And here the orchestra, you can play with both hands, but it's a very chamber music-like concerto, like Brahms' second piano concerto compared to the first piano concerto. The second one is more chamber music-like, and this concerto is full of soli for uh, oboe, for piccolo, for trumpet, for cor anglais, for horns. So now, to go to the more technical aspect, when we finally abandon this loop of... There 
is a tendency to run usually there, also because it's the pizzicati of the strings, and they also tend to run. I think you shouldn't run. So which edition am I using here? I usually use the, the, the traditional one, I think it's this French one, Durand, I think. But here I'm using the Ravel edition, because in France they did this new edition, very modern, kind of like Urtext, going to the sources again and trying to also amend some mistakes that traditionally were ca carried on. And actually they do one thing, which I already did way before this edition existed. They also take as a source uh, Marguerite Long's recording. So Marguerite Long was a French pianist and she was the one who premiered this concerto with Ravel conducting. And we have a recording of that. To be honest, it's not a very good recording in the sense of like the sound quality being together. Like, I don't know, maybe Ravel wasn't a great conductor. I don't know what was going on there, but even the beginning, like it's like... And then third bar, they got already together. But it's very informative. And we also have a book by Marguerite Long, who worked with Ravel very intensely. They were touring this concerto in many countries. So she is writing there the advices and the things he told her. So this Ravel edition is taking that into consideration as well. So now, here, what do we do with this glissandi? Because at the beginning, like, this is not a very fast beginning. And some of these glissandos are very long and very slow. So we, sh we would have this. Super slow. I would just recommend you to, <laughs> to start slowly, even stop with pedal. The orchestra is also playing at the same time, so you are not hurt. It's an effect, okay? It's an effect. Don't think that this is going to be hurt. So you just make a fast accelerando at the very end. So it has a more brilliant effect towards the end, right? It's... I would say this is not the most difficult piano concerto there is, to be honest. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying it's not the hardest, especially if you compare it to the left hand piano concerto, which is one of the hardest pieces I ever performed. So as you see, the concerto end, uh, begins with a piccolo solo and then a trumpet solo and then the tutti with the strings. Everybody's doing a solo except the pianist. Marguerite Long insisted that Ravel always insisted that this should not be played ritardando. There is of course a little bit of like easing into the next section, but it's very common to hear. Please don't do that. Please don't do it. I uh, just for me. For, just do it for me. It's a small favor. Okay, so now we have the Spanish influence, the flamenco influence. That's like the second main influence of this concerto. So we have this Basque country thing. Now we have some flamenco, which it sounds like kind of like a guitar, right? This. So that's, this is this the Phrygia mode, right? It's not written arpeggiato here, but uh, it should be done. Margarita Lon did it, Ravel asked for that, and actually that's a tradition everybody keeps, okay? But that melody, where does that come from? It's not flamenco. Third, the minor third, the seventh. It's blues, which is a way stronger influence in the left hand piano concerto, but it's also present here. And I think Ravel is <laughs> a genius. He's combining here three, four, five different influences, which usually don't mix up very well, like flamenco, blues, classical music, and it works. <laughs> Thank you. 
in case blues roots were not clear, okay? Ravel knew jazz. Uh, he, he was in the States and he got to listen to very good jazz orchestras from the 20s, swing orchestras, but also in Paris. It was very popular back then. And I would actually wonder if a composer from nowadays would want to incorporate popular music into his classical music creation, would he have to choose jazz? The question would be, is jazz nowadays the latest thing, the hit among the, the youngsters and the hipsters? The answer is no. <laughs> so we tend to forget that here Ravel was not incorporating this other long, serious, well-considered tradition. It was jazz, which was like a very popular genre of black Afro-American uh, uh, musicians. So it was popular music. So I think in the, in the analogy I just did, a composer today would incorporate maybe techno music. Actually, there is a, a, a composer, she's called Karen Tanaka, I think, and she has three techno etudes for piano solo. I think that would be the, the equivalent nowadays to what Ravel did with jazz. So here, Marguerite Lon and Ravel always change the tempo here, whenever that comes. So they have this fairly slow tempo, okay? And they don't continue with the same tempo. They don't do... Whenever we have this thing, go back to the faster tempo. So it's like there is two temporal realities living together, coexisting, but not influencing each other. We have the slow, the singing person, the blues, like female singer, imagine, okay? She's singing quite freely, improvisation-like, and then we have the rhythmical... always dragging back the singer. He's always uh, singing kind of like laid back. And then the orchestra enters, quite in tempo, quite exact and strict, okay? And this appears quite a number of times, like we have now. have to be able to to hear the melody throughout the the rhythmical interruption okay it's in. and again we have the same thing here now it's the orchestra playing the theme Now that we are talking about tempo, there is something which should be considered. If you listen to recordings of the orchestras of the beginning and first half of the 20th century, especially the American orchestras from, from the United States, they have a very different feeling for tempo. They usually play lighter, with not so much ritardandi, faster in general. You hear that in the recordings of Rachmaninoff, um, for example, Stokowski, they tend to play quite fast and light paced, almost like in these cartoons like Tom and Jerry, when you, you listen to the soundtrack, these orchestras which are playing these fast motifs and scales and sudden mood changes. I think there is something to be considered there uh, as a source of inspiration, because nowadays we tend to play everything heavier. Things that you should consider in the Ravel edition here 
Marguerite Elon doesn't play it. it. She clearly doesn't play it in the recording. And it makes sense, musically speaking. So we have here this melody, which is in two. actually have here a different time signature because suddenly the downbeat which was previously was always here here there there and now it's not here it's here and then again it's here yada rang yang and now it's not, it's again, and this is a, a triplet. I don't know if it makes sense what I'm saying, also because my way of writing is very chaotic. So it's... So what should one do? Like, clearly do this? I don't think so. Because then it would rob the music from its vagueness, from its ambiguity, from its interest. It's a very interesting rhythmical play. It's kind of like a joke. Suddenly the audience loses ground and they feel they are floating. And it's not only because of that rhythmical subtlety. It's also because of the harmony. We are all the time with this harmony. comes also from the blues, this, um, this like fourth, fifth sequence, right? I love him. I love Ravel. We also had previously in the melody the natural D. It's a D. Look at that natural sign I just wrote. Isn't that disgraceful? And that's why I think it helps not playing that bass. Okay, so we move on. We have this theme. We have also this kind of like two time signatures living at the same time in the melody itself, because we have this. It's a one, two, one, two. But left hand is one, one, two. It sounds almost like sati. It's in three. If not, it would have been too obvious. Nah, but this is way more interesting. talking about interesting uh, time signatures. Now here I wrote what in theory could be this theme. It's not in two always, it's... This bar, it's... Now a 3-4 bar. One, two, three. One, two, one, two, three. And now we have a 3-2 bar. Again, we don't have to overdo it. We have to know it. And then the audience might not know it, 
but they will feel there is something off and beautiful. But we don't have to show it. We have to show it if we are giving a masterclass, if we are teaching, or if I'm doing this video. But when we play, we don't have to teach. We don't even have to show. We have to be there. And maybe in our head, there are other things going on, but the audience should not be interested in that. So that would be a pedantic rendition of a piece. Also, Ravel is blurring this alternative interpretation, okay? Because he's aware that this could be too obvious. He could have written... So, playing always the bass on the downbeat of that imaginary bar. He's not. The bass always comes one fourth note later. That's very interesting. Also, the polyphony here, the contrapunct. Okay, Ravel writes it, separates it in both hands, but it's the same voice. This one. It's going there, there, there. Always four voices, the fifth voice being the bass. It's very neoclassical concerto in this sense. Now, these bars, tricky place with the orchestra. What to do? Should we, should we make an accelerando or not? I don't know. I really don't know. I usually see how the orchestra reacts, the conductor, and we try to do what's convincing for us and hopefully for the audience. That should always be your aim, to be convincing, to be clear, to have a defined idea of what you want to do and try to convey it as clearly as possible. And if you can't, it's because for you, as a person, as a, as a body of, of creating energies, that idea is not fitting you and you should then discard it. I usually tend to not make an accelerando here. Maybe in the last bar when the piano enters. It's also useful to see that the piano is also doubling the melody. We have in the melody F sharp, G sharp, and the piano has F sharp, G sharp as well. And this is the development, okay, the middle section. Which, is, which has this motoric, moto perpetuo like sense to it. The violin sonata has also a lot of jazz influences, actually, and I think the last movement is a moto perpetuo, meaning that there is always this non stop it pattern of quick notes that never stops. So it's like. It never stops. And the rhythm here, afterwards, from here on, starts to have this swing band, jazzy, rhythmical style, dancing style. This motif, um, it's always in a kind of like a 5-4 bar. It's 1-2, one, 1-2, two, one, two, three. One, two, one, two, 3 which we had here. That place is apparently the loudest place in, in the whole concerto because it has three Fs, okay? I think there is not again these three Fs. They don't appear again in the whole concerto. Interesting. And now we have this very like dance-like swing rhythm. Even this is like this swing band cliche of like the horse doing this kind of like mordente glissando and this rhythm not only the pianist does it also the bass double bass and cello i think so 
So one should consider, okay, this and this are helped by this and this. But who is doing this accent, which is so important for the rhythmical structure? It's not just ta 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 ta. It's ta 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 ta. Only the pianist is doing it. What I mean by that is that sometimes I tend to forget that and I just focus on the left hand and I do this. But the right hand should also be heard. And actually, if you the left hand you don't accentuate it that much, it's okay. Why? Because the double basses and Celli are doing it as well. And also this is a, uh, this is a motive from the concerto. Um, yes, here. Now, now, now I, I remember exactly where it appears, this motive, as it is. Here we have it. It's the same. And again, this polytonality, like using two keys at the same time, uh, we have based on the note A, but the right hand is playing G sharp major. That also like kind of Milio Stravinsky, uh, it's very typical from this era. This kind of like Cadenza. Or it's not even a cadenza, I think it's a fermata. In the classical term of the word, it's like these fermatas of like an aria for singer and orchestra from Mozart, for example. It's like this fermata which should be sung in just one breath. It's not a cadenza, full cadenza. Cadenzas actually come from fermatas. And fermatas, the rule would always say that it should be sung only in one breath. The singer could show off as much as they would want from their virtuosity, but only in one breath. If not, uh, they would cut the flow of the music. The cadenza, the dominante. Okay, they would ruin that. And they should, of course, not go into other keys. It makes sense. If you only have one breath, you cannot go from C major to G major, F major, E minor, whatever. That's like the, the, the full-grown cadenzas that Beethoven would end up doing. So here we have kind of like this dominante of G major. We have... And then we have a small fermata. But of course, in Ravel's style, which is this. The thing is, how should you play that? Fast, slow. Some people play it like the same tempo uh, as before. It's true that Ravel didn't do a great job writing down this because he's not saying anything. But he told Marguerite Long, this should be played like the fermatas, the cadenzas at the beginning of Liszt Etude Mazeppa. And then we know, oh, okay, he wants that kind of like style of like... Uh... Whatever, I never played that etude, okay? So this free with pedal, quite fast and very like, like, a, like waves of the sea going on and going on and overwhelming you. Nevertheless, it has structure. It has kind of like this time signature I'm gonna now show. I'm gonna over, overdo it, okay? And now... There is an, uh, an implicit accelerando. So, in a faster tempo, it sounds like this.
And there you have the Gran Casa, el bombo, doing... Should they go straight right away immediately? That's very hard to catch when the pianist is playing so fast and the conductor has to like give the cue for the orchestra to begin. The recording of Margarita Long and Ravel, they wait. It's like, okay, the fermata ends up in this uncertainty. And then, of course, way faster than that. And it works perfectly. There's no stress and uh, um, everybody's happier. And it actually, it sounds even better. And now we have the, 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 the melody of the beginning. This is, of course, the recapitulation. But Ravel is writing it in what I call, it's like cubism, the, the painting style, painting genre of Picasso or Juan Gris. It's cubist. It's like the melody is there, but it's deformed and transposed constantly into different registers. For example, this. It's You see, right? It's uh, it's like it's broken. Here I rearrange the voices in a very comfortable way, okay? I don't do this jump. I do So now I have this and this. Now, recapitulation is exactly the same. I mean, kind of the same. Here we have something, the piano didn't play this in the exposition, but now we do this, okay? The rhythm is quite peculiar. It's a 3-4 bar. It's a valse. And also the right hand of the pianist does that. One. Two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one. Okay. And right hand is doing an emiolia. We have the... And left hand is doing... Two against three. So we have... It's very messy. That's why usually people are not together there. But ideally, the mood should change and be obvious that it's not this rhythmical, percussive thing. Easy. From the point of view of the structure, recapitulation is the same. But now he's doing something very typical from this era, actually. These composers inherit this musical form, which is the sonata, for example, or the piano concerto. And it's amazing. It has very good qualities. But some of its qualities go out of fashion. Like, composers don't feel the need of doing certain things anymore. One of them is repeating everything in the recapitulation. And composers start to think, okay, how do we deal with this? Especially in a piano concerto, like right? In the concerto genre. It's like, do I do again the whole thing, but now staying in the tonica? That's very predictable. So, for example, Prokofiev in his second piano concerto does something very similar to what Ravel does. In the concerto genre, you also have the cadenza, okay? Where the pianist plays a solo. And now they think, okay, maybe the recapitulation could be the cadenza. So they compose these long cadenzas where the pianist plays an abridged and reducted version of the exposition, which was exposed <laughs> by the pianist and the orchestra together. And now it's only the pianist. That's also why those cadenzas are usually very long and very difficult. It's like an arrangement for piano solo. And with that, they have done the recapitulation and the cadenza at the same time. And as we say in Spanish, I don't know in English, you kill two birds with one bullet, okay? Matar dos pájaros de un tiro. That's a very clever 
way of dealing with that structural problem. And here Ravel does something very similar, because now the recapitulation structurally is the same, but it's, it's written out in the form of cadenzas, in plural, because now it's not the pianist, the only one who does a cadenza. We first have the harp doing a solo. We have this. And then the melody. Which is... the way is lower, of course. The harmonic change we had before. Now it's the same, we had the... Ravel here writes this 4-4 four, four bar, because as I said earlier, there is one extra bit. And now here, he actually writes that down. Now again, we have this... Um, And it continues now, it's a, 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 a cadenza for the woodwinds. This is a very, very difficult solo for the whole woodwind section, like the fagot, especially the, the oboe, the horn, who is playing pianissimo and very high. It's, it's very tricky, okay? And now they, they end. And now comes the third thing, which the piano did like this. Now the piano does it in his own cadenza. So we had the harp cadenza, the woodwinds cadenza, now the piano cadenza. And meanwhile, we are not only doing cadenzas for the sake of it. The cadenzas are following strictly the concerto form, the sonata form. We are recapitulating everything almost in the same way. So now we have this third theme, but now in G major. Same theme. If you played fast, like that, too fast, you realized it's the same theme. And the way he writes this cadenza is the same way he writes the cadenza of the left hand piano concerto. Whatever, it's been a long time since I don't play it. It's like this aeolic harp, la harpa aeolica, right? But since we have here two hands, he adds this, it's like a vibration of the soul, I would say. It's like your spirit, it's trepidating with emotion, right? It's... The tricky thing is the pedal. Because immediately it can saturate the sound if you don't take care of your pedal. If you just press it full down, it sounds thick, heavy, 
not clear. You need a lot of megapixels, a lot of definition. It, it has to sound crispy. It's not this thing of like... It's like puntillismo, this uh, pictorial genre. I don't know how you say it in English. Puntillismo. Also, at the same time, the problem here is that you don't have this bass and like this. Like giving you this harmonic uh, consistency. It can sound too thin, so whenever you play a bass, take advantage of it. It's giving you warmth. It's filling the gaps. And this continues with the form, the structure of the concerto, because we have this. And now we have... And then, from here on, this is the coda. It again, there is again this thing. And here Ravel is quite chaotic in the way he writes the left hand, for example. Sometimes he writes this three notes, okay, and two notes, but then here it's two notes, two notes, and then it's like three notes there, and now it's one note, and now it's like, uh, that's a G, but this is an F, honestly, nobody cares, nobody hears that, so I usually play whatever my hand wants to play. It kind of makes sense from a counterpoint point of view, okay? Not to duplicate certain voices. Anyway, the orchestra, the full string section is doing... There's not much else to say about this, this, uh, this ending. It's again kind of like a, it's a secondary development actually, very typical from the classicism as well. Like you have the appassionata sonata, first movement, when the recapitulation ought to end, it doesn't. And suddenly you have this long section which is again developing all the material that appeared in the sonata. It's the same here. One question actually, should, we, should one play this note a G instead of an A if you have a Bösendorfer which has more keys than this one because this is the last one but harmonically there it makes sense if we transpose it here it makes sense to play a G it's and now it's an A because it's this but before it's also beautiful but I think it's all this ascending scale in the bass, which should be G, A, A, B flat, C, D, E flat, E natural, and F, finally. So it should begin with a G. Open question. We said the reason here... So should we play that rhythm also here? Because we could do... There 
is a lot of noise there, okay? So <laughs> don't think about that too much. That won't make a huge difference. But I think it's something to consider, okay? And also not to get tired of these pieces. Like, no matter how great a piece is, we can end up getting tired of them quite easily. And these kind of like open questions, which should always remain as open questions, are food for your brain, right? Year after year after year. So now we have the second movement. Ravel said that he tried to write it as well, he wanted it to be a well-written movement. So it sounds very technical, right? It's like, and, 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 and he was, like he was a person who, who loved this like lead uh, soldiers, like these toys, this mechanism, these toys which would be automated with a mechanism and they would move, these clocks. So he had a very technical approach to music and to composing as well. He said that he painstakingly composed this fair cadenza for months and that he had to, it's not like this Mozart thing of like, I'm just coming up with this genius melody and I just see it and write it as it comes to me. No, no, no. He was working bar after bar. And actually it's quite amazing that in all of these 34 bars, there is no one single bar which repeats itself at all. There's always some difference in the melody outline, in the harmony, in the rhythmical structure. It's like this concept of the, the one contains the many, the variety, and the variety contains the unity. I think it's the same, this kind of like the idea of developing a flower from just one seed. He took inspiration from Mozart's clarinet quintet, apparently, the larghetto, the, the slow movement, also from some trips he did in Navarra, actually. Puerto de Velate is a, a mountain port, you say in English. The views are amazing there. Apparently he got inspiration from that place as well. I think Margarita Long said that. Left hand and right hand are clashing the whole time. Right hand is almost always in 3-4 time signature. but left hand is in 6-8, kind of, kind of like a valse. It's also kind of like a saraband as well, this... Um... From the point of view of building a structure, a building, this is genius, okay? For example, we could focus our attention in the base, okay? And now he jumps one octave high. And now we go down very, very slowly. to be the dominant and actually after this kind of like small stop to rest a little bit it goes up an octave and again continues going down it goes up one octave but continues the downfall Actually, later on, after staying in C sharp for quite a long time, which is the minor relative key of E major, continues the downwards movement. And 
now for the first time, we are going up. And actually, this is the lowest point of the melody at the same time. So we have the feeling that we are rock button, okay? The melody. This G sharp is the lowest note of the whole melody. So we have the feeling we really reached the deep register, okay? When we hit rock button, there's only one way, which is up. And now the bass finally also goes up with the melody. And now it goes down for one last time to go again to the dominant. So that's one voice and see how interesting it is. We could do that same process with the melody as well and how they interact. And there is one thing I think Dave Bruce Composer, amazing YouTube channel, once in one video talked about the, this kind of like concept with, which is yes, but. Meaning that when there is a change in some of the parameters of the music, like the harmony changes, if every single parameter of the music changes at the same time, like the harmony, the melody, the structure, the instrumentation, it sounds too obvious. So usually we blur, we know, I mean, composers blur the lines that separate sections doing this yes, but. Like, for example, I change the harmony, but I keep the same instrumentation. Or uh, there is a dissonance which resolves, but at the same time there is a note which was not a dissonant that now changes to a dissonance. That's a way of never turning off completely the, the, the machine, the car. If you fully stop a car, then you have to restart it again. That's why there is always something which is like, yes, but. But let's continue here. I think Ravel is doing the same with dissonances here. We have this. This should resolve. And when the bass resolves, the G, G sharp to F sharp. But then the melody gets to a new dissonance. Actually taking the G sharp from the bass. Which resolves here. But at the same time, now the bass moves to an E, creating a new dissonance. Now this D sharp has to resolve and resolves in a C sharp. And actually we see that the bass and the melody are all the time having this tense relationship of the ninth. when it resolves, instead of being a ninth, it's a tenth or a third, actually. It's so well thought that this is not coincidence. This, you can see Ravel painstakingly composing note after note and thinking through all the details. I think that's why some people don't get moved actually by Ravel or this music, which I don't understand and, and I don't share the feeling. But I can relate to that. I see where these people come from. They come from a sick mind, not getting moved by Ravel. But also it's like, I can see that some people see something which is cerebral and cold in the way Ravel composed. It's a pity, I think they are missing out one of the most beautiful things you can experience as a human being but I see what they mean. So with this structure, the thing is that it's so slow and so spaced out, and it's always this yes, but. I said, it's all the time this relationship of the ninth between the bass and the melody. Yes, but. Sometimes the ninth doesn't come at the same time. It's softened by this appoggiatura from the tenth. 
I'm not gonna go more uh, like deeper into the analysis of, of this melody because it would take a whole video. But as you can see, I think this is the way of dealing with these kind of passages which are so convoluted and you actually don't know what to do, where to go, where are you, where do you come from and where are you going to? Questions you should answer also as a human being. Try not to put the left pedal, by the way, here. The sordina. The, the, because he's not writing that. And he is writing that here. Sordina. The thing is that we are used to practice in small rooms, like this one, with not very good pianos. Not like this one. I like my piano. But, uh, so we tend to use the left pedal as a softening uh, device, which it is. But that's a collateral effect. The main effect of the left pedal is, is changing the color of the sound. And here we want a pianissimo, but we want the same texture we had before, the same flavor, the same color, okay? so hard to stop playing this when once you start it's it's because it's it's full of this yes but it's never ending and 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 you are all, all the time you are wondering oh really what else oh really and and what do you mean by that oh please continue oh i see intriguing it's like that you have to have a relationship with this kind of music which is in that way that is keeping the attention of the audience but also your attention as well. And also like, as you can see, this kind of like a very theoretical approach to it, but then it's your body, the one who has to internalize and incorporate, tu cuerpo, your body, has to incorporate it. So it's your body, the one who enters in this flow state of mind. And again, don't give a masterclass, don't give a lecture to the audience, like, and now this dissonance go here and there. No, 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 that's no way of playing. That's, I, I would say that's a way of working and organizing your head around such a complex music. Okay, one last question regarding this movement, the tempo. Which tempo? I think the tempo Ravel shows us here is a very good one. Actually, I would tell you, you can play it a little bit slower than that because it's the initial cadenza, cadenza, sorry. But from here on, when the orchestra enters, I would take that tempo. So we have maybe, we are slower here. And then you take this tempo that he wrote. By the way, your solo ends in the subdominant. Yes, but. So one would expect that now the solo ends and it's dominante, tonica. And now it's like dominante, tonica with this minor seventh, which makes it... And then the audience, if they didn't cry yet, that's the place where they cry. Because it's like, you, you, you are full of emotions, you are overwhelmed, you cannot take it anymore. And finally you are going to release, like, okay, now Ravel and the pianist is letting us breathe and process the whole journey we just went through. Look, my, my, I, ha I have goosebumps. And then at the very end you get... because the journey continues and goes on and goes on until the very last bar. The tempo is also important because now woodwinds come. And how do woodwinds play? With wind, <laughs> with their breathing. And if you play too slow, maybe, I mean, if they are virtuosos, they can, but then they have to do some extra breathings, which 
don't help the musical discourse. The music falls apart, in my opinion, and in Marguerite Long's and Ravel's opinion as well. So I would, try, I would trust them, not me. Don't trust me. Trust Ravel and Marguerite Long. And that's it. Now we have this solo of the Cor Anglais. Again, the thing we had in the first movement. How do I do a recapitulation without being too boring or repetitive? So now it's the Cor Anglais, and the pianist is accompanying with this. Do you say filigrin, filigrana? Ideally, you could rehearse with the English horn player. I mean, outside the, the rehearsal with the orchestra and the conductor. Just ask him or her, could you stay for just 10 minutes after the rehearsal and we played together? And together, I mean, also close by, like together. Because if not, usually the, the English horn is super far away and you kind of hear him, but not so much. And he doesn't hear you. It's a mess. So then you, you get also to a, a, a common version of the theme. And so he sees what's your version, your intention. Where do you do rubato, ritardando? They tend to do many ritardando. And that's uh, like, uh, uh, that's, it gets on my nerves. So you have to do. That's awful. So try not to do that. And now, do we cover up him or her here or not? Is it a risk? I mean, it is, but not so much. Why? Because we are in different registers. Cor anglais is... And we are here. If you play chemi music, if the oboe is playing here, like the cor anglais or is playing, and you are here, you are sharing the same frequencies, and it's going to be tricky not to cover each other up. But if you are here, it's going to be way easier. And one last thought about this. So the ideal thing here is that you shouldn't be like looking at the cor anglais like and he shouldn't be looking at you like okay what's the pianist doing okay here if you rehearsed in advance and you are confident and you have the same goals And it just happens, and you are just together. And it's the most beautiful and, and happiest day in your life. And last movement, it's, this is Stravinsky, this is Petrushka. It could be like, uh, yeah, Petrushka. Or even like... How to practice this? I have a video on YouTube. It's kind of like a joke. How to practice it? So, first of all, Ravel said this. Play only the inner voice. The melody, actually. That's what Ravel said with your own fingering, don't change the fingering, then only the harmony. From now on, it's my advice. Ravel only said about the melody, but this I say. That way you also learn how to, because your hands and your thumbs, they are sharing a very narrow space. So they come 
bump into each other and like push. So you have to learn how to like, and like this, now like this, now like this, this, and now like here, for example, this is very tricky. You have to be very conscious of this movement. You see it's right hand is down and now goes up. It's like this, very fast. And now, what's the key of this? Is this G major? It's not. It's G Lydian because it's ha it has the augmented fourth. It's It's not That's super weird. It's And now it goes to uh C but not C major, as far as I remember. It's also C Lydian, because it has, again, the augmented fourth. So. The first chords are in G Lydian, because it has an F sharp and a C sharp. Okay. And now we go to F. Lydian again with the augmented fourth. I think we have also here this metric playfulness, right? One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Now, this movement, how fast is it? Depends on you and depends on the orchestra. Depends on the bassoon player, on the violas, on everybody, on the horns as well. Now, we have here a shared theme between the orchestra and the pianist. So you should hear the whole theme throughout. Like when you do chamber music, when you stop playing, you don't stop listening. One, two, three, four, five, five bars, okay? We have, it begins here and ends there. Because you play that melody with your thumbs. And this is not a new beginning, it's not. Meaning that this is a one bar, It's uh, so you should play. That's exaggerated, but it's not. This is very difficult as well. You need strong fingers, of course, and I would take out one note as well, which is this one. I mean, I can play it, but it's better to just leave that note out so you have time to recover your energies and play marcatissimo. Then it's very important also in this movement, this rhythm. That is present throughout most of the movement, okay? Actually, this is... It's kind of like... But it's broken, and it also begins in the second beat. So this could be... That's very weird, right? Again, let's think. How does the audience receive this beginning? Do they receive it like this? Unless the orchestra does. But they shouldn't, because it's not written like that. Like, the drums and everybody's playing like fortissimo from there, very marcato. So the, the audience is hearing a 2-4 bar beginning here. So it's like also the pianist is stepping in too early. It's interrupting the orchestra. We have which also gives this this hectic agitato playful quality. So now we have the second theme which is very very hard for the horns. Oh remember this Picasso thing I told you about the cubist way of rearranging notes like so, here's the same. We have... And now Ravel writes this. 
It's amazing. It's the same. It's. That way, he's also bringing up the inherent structure of this chromatic scale, which is the augmented fifth chord. And he is making explicit this structure. And now, of course, we have this. I say of course because it's the most, maybe most difficult passage of, of the whole concerto. It's famous for that. This is Oscar Peterson. This is Art Tatum. It's kind of like Art Tatum, especially tompa, conca, with those jams. And the right hand is like freely improvising and going crazy fast. So, and again, we have here polytonality, two keys at the same time. Right hand is uh, D sharp major. Left hand is C sharp major with seven. So we actually have two dominants at the same time. We have this and we have this. Uh, left hand resolves. Right hand doesn't resolve so much. It does. not Oscar Peterson anymore. This is maybe, I don't know... Ah, he died recently. What was his name? Wayne Shorter. Rachmaninoff does that as well. Like, he's also paying homage to these kind of pianists, especially Art Tatum. In his uh, Rhapsody on a Thing of Paganini, there's one variation which is like this. <laughs> which is like the style of Art Tatum, which they knew. Rachmaninoff and Horowitz knew Art Tatum, like they knew how fucking amazing he was. So even in Rachmaninoff, you see here the jazz, blues, language. The thing is, should you play this fast, even if you can? Maybe not, but Marguerite Lom says in the book and in the recording she does that herself, she plays it faster. It's a showy place. You have to show off your technique, okay? It's okay. But then, of course, the tempo should go down uh, for the bassoon player to play his solo. Which is very, very difficult. Let me tell you two things. One. Last time I played this was in Bucharest with the Enescu Orchestra. And the bassoon player is... Uh, it's, it's, it's alien. I don't know how he did it. We were rehearsing. I was there listening and I was thinking, okay, now it's the moment of truth for the bassoon player. Let's see how he does it. It was perfect. We thought, okay, impressive. Let's see when we repeat it. We repeated it. Perfect. Again. Second day of rehearsal. General rehearsal. Perfect. And actually, in general rehearsal, I decided, okay, I'm going to turn and I'm going to look at him. Like, how does he do it? And not only was he, like, calm and playing, like, no problem, he was playing the part of the second bassoon. What I mean with this is that Ravel knew that this was so difficult that he divided the solo between the two bassoons. So, first bassoon is playing, I don't know how many bars, but like eight bars, and then second bassoon is playing eight bars, and then eight bars, eight bars, whatever. Also so they can breathe. Second bassoon was not playing this solo at all. He played the whole thing. I'm guessing he did this circular breathing, but he didn't need a break, and that's the best, because sometimes you hear this gap between the first and second bassoon. I don't know, man, whoever you are, I don't remember your name, you are the best. And, and, and the concert, he did it again perfect. And like... Smiling! Man, I adore you. The second thing I wanted to say about this develop development. This is again Ravel going to traditional classical cliches of the concerto. Why? He's doing the same thing as Beethoven did in his third piano concerto, 
Brahms did in his first piano concerto, Rachmaninoff did in his second piano concerto, which is that the last movement, the third movement in this case, the development is a fugue. So here is the same. Now we have a, a fugue where, thanks God, the pianist doesn't have to do much. We do this. Which is okay. And then we just... And this is like a double, triple, quadruple fugue. You have one theme. Second theme. Third theme. Fourth theme. And all of those themes are happening at the same time. I mean, you have to love Ravel, please. And that's it. Then we have a recapitulation. Fairly simple. Oh, there's one place where I do, I rearrange the, 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 the notes and I think it's way easier than the way Ravel wrote it. I mean, it's not the hardest thing to do, but as you can see, hands are overlapping and that's very uncomfortable. I have big hands, maybe that's my problem. Especially the next one. Very uncomfortable. I do this. I do that in case you want to to copy that uh, to copy me in which case please donate some money to my patreon and that's it i always wonder why ravel wrote that silence why not and join the orchestra from that first chord i don't know by the way here if you have a g like in a Bösendorfer, you should also play a G. Not play A, G, but G, G. But I don't have a G here, of course. And that's it. I hope you, I, I, I don't know, I illuminated some aspects of this masterpiece. Of course, it was not a thorough, uh, exhaustive, like, run through the whole concerto. That would make no sense for YouTube. Maybe I would, I don't know, share with you a final thought. Like, last time I played this, I was not very happy with the piano. The thing is that the first day I played it, I wasn't feeling very happy with it. And uh, immediately we tend to, to start getting too self-critical of our way of playing and thinking, today I'm playing shitty because I am a shitty pianist. One needs experience, of course, stage experience, to start knowing why certain things are not working the way they should that day. It could be you, but it could be many other things, like the acoustic, the orchestra, the piano. You just, I don't know, feel under the weather, maybe you are sick, whatever. So that's, that first day, in order not to go down into despair while playing, it's like, okay, man, you are not feeling very happy, but you still have 25 more minutes to play, so cheer up. It's useful to think, okay, Juan, don't think you are doing an awful job. Just think that probably this piano is not helping you at all, which it wasn't. And actually, don't be so egotistic, meaning that if things are good, it's because of you. And if things are bad, it's also because of you. None of this is only about you. It's not just you. The funny thing is that the next day we performed the concerto again. Same hall, same orchestra, same piano. And I was very happy, actually. I went into the concert because maybe now I got used to the fact that the piano was not good and I stopped fighting. Because when you fight the piano or the acoustic, you lose energy and you lose focus and you stop being on the flow, right? And you stop being in the music. That's where you should be. Second day, I just, okay, gave up. The piano is not good. Okay, there's nothing I can do. And then I started focusing on what I should have been focusing on from the very beginning, which was music and communication with the orchestra, which is the main reason why I adore this concerto, because it's chamber music at its best. And I love chamber music.